Before we get started this morning, let's not let's not miss the miracles that we see around us. Today we are joined again by Angela and by Bud. Praise God for the healing that took place in their bodies. Praise God for the miracle that he has laid upon them. And praise God that we get to enjoy them this morning. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Just a couple of other things before we get started. Uh, thank you, everyone who's bringing stuff for Teen Challenge. That pile continues to grow in my closet within the next couple of weeks. I'll arrange a trip up there. Um, keep in mind as well, uh, just as you have felt led to provide for the food pantry on site in the past, if you're in Kroger or what I almost said Market Basket, I was almost back in Massachusetts. If, if you're in a grocery store in and around the Roanoke area or further, and you feel led to pick up some stuff that you would normally pick up for the food pantry, uh, please do not hold back in doing that. We're, going, we're still partnering uh, for food insecurity in the Valley with you, except we're just allocating our resources to the Friendship House, who does a fantastic job of distributing uh, to those who are struggling with food insecurity during these times. And the need keeps growing. There was a piece on NPR recently, and they were looking at uh, Feeding America through the Kentucky branch, and given the fact that COVID uh, help is now coming to a close, the needs are the same, but the resources are less. So uh, not asking you to give out a compulsion. If you feel led to, please keep in mind that we are still part of that ministry, and we are blessed to do so. And then lastly, I just want to thank you also for your prayers for Tim and Tabby. Um, they are settling in so nicely up in Massachusetts. Tim has a job. I got a uh, message the other day from Tabby that Tim worked 13 hours on his first day. So he is, he's hitting the, the rubber to the road with it. So praise God for that. Tabby had an interview with the Massachusetts version of Kroger, which is Stop and Shop. Um, so please pray for her that she uh, is able to get that job as well. Praise God for all of this. Will you please pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you that steadfast love and faithfulness does not forsake us. Lord God, we ask that you bind it around our neck and write it on the tablet of our heart. Lord God, we look to find favor and good success in the sight of you and man, that we may glorify you. Dear Lord, I pray that you establish in us a trust in you and you only with all of our heart. That we were able to put aside our own understanding. That in all our ways, we would acknowledge you. That you will make straight our path. Lord God, let us not be wise in our own eyes. Place the fear of you upon our heart that we would turn away from evil, Lord. Let it have a purpose. And Lord God, we look to you, the establishment and perfection of our faith, understanding that it is healing to our flesh and refreshing to our bones. Father, we thank you for the miracles that we see happening in and around us every day. The root of our faith that grows through your word, through your love. Let it be a conviction of our heart this morning as we look into your word, Lord God, that you are truth, that you are life. We praise you, Jesus. It's in your precious name we pray. Amen. If the children would like to go downstairs with Miss Irma this morning, they are welcome to do so. For the rest of you, we're going to be looking at John chapter 11. We're going to continue our look into Jesus raising Lazarus 
And if you're paying attention, you're noticing that this week we're actually backtracking a little bit. We're going to look at a couple of verses that we actually took a look at last week. And this is important because this is a major transition in the Gospel of John. John wrote his book, and it seems to take on two faces. One is the book of signs, and the second is the book of glory. And we are shifting from the book of signs to the book of glories within this very small vignette here of the raising of Lazarus. And last week, we looked at it through the eyes of Mary of Bethany, because Mary of Bethany was so important to spreading the gospel in the first century church. Her, her love, her dedication, her worship of the Lord became something that people wanted to hear more about. They wanted to emulate that. They wanted to imitate that. Well, this week, I want to look at it through the eyes of our Lord, the act that's done here. See, because God never works one-dimensionally. And this morning when we came here and we celebrated the, the restoration of the body of Angela and the restoration of the body of Bud, understand that that is not the sole miracle. We have no idea, and we will probably not have an idea until we come into glory, what God had done with these two individuals that he blessed, he walked with, he comforted, and he healed during their trials. This is what we're seeing manifested here. So if you would, let's read through. We're going to start back in verse 33, just for context, because context matters. So starting in verse 33, chapter 11, John writes, When Jesus saw her, Mary of Bethany, weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. Now remember, this is not Jesus being just sad. He's not having a bad day. The Greek to this actually is Jesus making a sound similar to a horse. He's upset. Dare I say he's angry. The Greek actually describes the action of... <sighs> Jesus is looking around, and as Paul writes, the wages of sin is death. He is seeing the hurt, the pain, and the tragedy that comes along with the death that is caused by the sin of man. God had never made man with the intention that anyone would ever be in a tomb, nor come to a tomb, nor mourn around a tomb. God had made each and every one of us, starting with Adam and Eve, that we would be in communion with him, that we would be in that communion eternally with him, that we would be at rest with him. What you're seeing here is the absolute love of God. And what you're seeing here is his absolute hatred for the sin that causes the death, the pain, and the hurt in this world. And even this is used for his glory. And he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Who are the they? The they are the Jewish leaders. The ones that wanted to stone him just a short time ago at the Feast of Dedication. There's two times in the Gospel of John that we actually see the anger of God come out in the man of Christ Jesus. The first time is clearing the temple. Imagine what it would take that you have all of your means, all of your goods, all of your money there. You are surrounded by people with the same intention, and there is one man, and he is chasing after you with a whip, and you do not have it in you to say, let's stop this guy. What Jesus exhibited that day was scary. What Jesus is exhibiting now, understand because of his absolute desire for you that you should live experiencing the pain, experiencing the anger. These men were scared. They did not look to stone him. They saw Jesus angry and they said to him, Lord, notice the change in perspective. Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. 
And once again, not a loud wailing, but the emotions that overtook Jesus caused tears to roll down his face. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. The word love here is the phileo love. See the tight relationship Jesus had with him. Think David and Jonathan. Think about your closest friend, men or women, that you do anything for. You have a relationship with this person. You have experience with this person. You've done stuff. You've lived life with this person. But they don't get it. That is not the purpose for Jesus being there at that exact moment, at that exact time. It has nothing to do with the filet of love that he had for Lazarus. Lazarus was a catalyst for what he was trying to achieve. It had everything to do with the love that God had for the world, that he would give his only son. But in order for it to resonate with people, they would have to understand who that son is. Who this man is, Jesus of Nazareth, Christ in the flesh, God with his outstretched hands. They would need to understand the fullness of this. And this is how we enter into the book of glory because it has nothing to do with Lazarus. It has to do with the fact that even the Jewish leaders that wanted to stone him, Jesus said to them back in, in chapter 10, he said, if I am not doing the works of my father, then do not believe me. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father, even those that tried to kill him, his enemies. He's saying, if you don't believe what I'm saying, at least believe what I'm doing. Let that be the mustard seed in you. Let it grow in you. He's not trying to preserve his own life. He's looking at their eternity and he wishes life for them. As John said, that's the purpose for writing of all of these signs that Jesus has done so that you may believe and that by believing you shall have eternal life. And maybe you say, well, Jesus, Jesus, yeah, I believe in him. But what do you believe in him? Because this matters. There is not, I mean, I guess there's a handful now that are trying to, to make Jesus a myth, an urban legend. But most agnostic and atheist scholars at least acknowledge the fact that Jesus was a major historical figure, that he existed. Why? Well, let's not use the Bible because that's biased. That's, that's just one book. No, that's 66 books that all point to him from many different authors. But let's take it outside of any type of scripture. Are you going to set aside the Roman historians? Are you going to set aside the, the Jewish historians who never professed Christ, but talked about the movement? Are you going to set aside the other Roman historians that talked about the followers of Christ and how they were dying and how they died just like him? And how no matter what, they would not renounce his name. The faith and what you think of Jesus, what you think of God matters. And that's why we see the next purpose. It says in, in, in 11.6, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So, because, because of this love, when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Did they believe in Jesus? They were friends with Jesus. Did they understand his teaching? Yes. Martha actually tells Jesus. When, when Jesus comes to her she, and he says, don't worry, Lazarus will live. She goes, yeah, I get it, Lord. I get it. I, I've heard your teaching. I understand what you say, that in the resurrection he will, he will live. It wasn't that she didn't understand his teaching. It's not about having a cognitive understanding of this book. It's about having faith in him, the glorious Savior. The same thing with the disciples. My goodness, they spent three years with him, over three years at this point. They had faith in him. Marrying the Gospels, we see that at this point, Peter has already said to him, you are the Christ. But what did it mean? It mean that, that meant that his, his faith still needed to be developed. 
Jesus said to the disciples plainly, Lazarus has died. And it's for your sake. I am glad that I was not there so that you may also believe. It was beyond just being with Jesus. It was beyond just learning from Jesus. It was having absolute faith in Jesus that he was trying to instill in them. And it wasn't for the Lazarus, the love that he had for Lazarus. It was the love that he had for Peter and John and Judas. It was the love that he had for Mary and Martha and Lazarus. It was the love that he had for every one of those Jewish leaders that was trying to kill him, that they should believe. And as John says, that by believing, they shall have life in his name. This is the purpose. It's the purpose of us coming together on Sunday to grow that faith. See how they loved him? No. See how he loves you? That he would do this in front of you. Church of Roanoke, see, see how he loves you? That he would bring a bud and an Angela into our presence. That we would love them so much that our heart would pour out for them. That we would lift them up in prayer. That we would visit them in their darkest hour. That we would, we would beg God with petition saying, Lord God, please do something. I love this person. I, I, I fully acknowledge the fact that the day that they are with you, they will be in glory, that they will dance in a way that they have never danced before with a joy that they have never experienced, that they wait to be in your arms as, as you welcome them and say, well done, my faithful servant, but Lord God, to save myself from the grieving that was brought on by the sin that I've myself have committed, please rescue them. And he did. He answered. That's the love he has for us. Some of them said, could not he who will open the eyes of the blind man also kept this man from dying? Some were afraid, some were still just jerks. Then Jesus deeply moved again. Remember, he's angry. He came to the tomb. It was a cave. The stone lay against it. This just means it was a vertical cave. Lazarus was loaded. Rich people were buried in vertical caves. Poor people in horizontal caves. That's important in a couple of weeks when we look at Mary again. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha said, the sister of the dead man, she said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead for four days. You see, she recited Jesus' words, but she didn't have faith in, in Jesus. And this is so Martha. She understands the authority of Jesus, but she just doesn't understand the capabilities of Jesus and the sovereignty of Jesus. Martha wants to serve him. Jesus, I don't want you to smell a stink. So Martha, this is what she does. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? Did I not tell you that if, if you believed, you'd see God in your midst, the glory of God? Just as he told Philip when Philip was amazed by this little thing and he said, oh my goodness, yes, I believe. And he said, Philip, you will see far greater things. You will actually see the Son of Man as the access to heaven. He's telling Martha the same thing. No, no, no. I, I don't need you to believe in that, Martha. I need you to believe in me. Place absolute faith in me. That is the miracle. I am the treasure. That's what Jesus is saying. So they took away the stone and Jesus lifted up his eyes and he said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know that you always hear me. And I said this on account of the people standing around that they may believe that you sent me. We see Jesus' prayer right there. Number one, we see from this prayer, he says, I thank you that you heard me. I know that you always hear me. Why? Because Jesus is always in communion with the Father. He is one with the Father. 
I know Jesus went away to pray, to get away from the noise of the world, but there was not one step, there was not one breath that was in complete unison with the will of the Father. Jesus and the Father are one. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. He says, I know that you always hear me, Father, but I say this on account of the Jews that want to kill me, the disciples that profess my name, and Mary and Martha and Lazarus, that they would believe. I say this on account of them, Father, because of your love for them. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. Now the wording here is important. The man who died came out. That's what men do. Not because it's God's will. But because of their sin. Because of our sin. Because of the fallenness of this world. But Jesus cried out, Lazarus, come out. And the man who died came out. His hands and his feet were bound with linen strips and his face with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Now we start seeing the manifest of the glory of Jesus. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary, many of the Jews who wanted to stone him, who treasured their earthly life as being thought of as being great pious people, who had a great place in society, who had a great place in in, in the synagogue, many of them believed in him. Remember what this means. Their life is over. It didn't matter. See, the sign wasn't just for Lazarus. They saw the, the, the friendship that he had with Lazarus, and okay, that's where that seed started. But now they came to terms with the fact that, oh my goodness, this is him. their heart would be lifted with praise. As the prophet Isaiah wrote, O Lord, you are my God, I will exalt you. I will praise your name, for you have done wonderful things, plans formed of old, faithful and sure. And then the prophet says, he will swallow up death forever, and the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces, and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. And it will be said on that day, behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. That's what they experienced. The raising of Lazarus is showing that Jesus had power over death. The raising of Lazarus for those that had no faith was the establishment of faith, that mustard seed planted into the, into the heart of those that wanted to kill him. For those that saw Jesus as a friend and believed merely in his words, oh my gosh, that shine light on the true love that God had for them that he would manifest himself right before him, that he would be Emmanuel, God with us. And even for the disciples that walked with the Lord for three years and professed with their mouth, they now believed with their heart that Jesus is Lord. Paul tells the church in Corinth, these are established, baptized believers. He tells them, examine yourselves. See whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Or do you not realize this about yourself, that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless, indeed, you fail to meet the test. There is one command that we have. One minor step to receive that gift, and that is to believe in him. And it's not a one-and-done prayer. 
It's not, it's not the sinner's prayer. Oh, okay, God, I believe in you. I give my life to you. I, I want Jesus in my heart. It's not that. It is a daily walk. It is a daily commitment. He says, unless you are willing to pick up your cross daily and walk with me, that is, that is what he's calling us to. Who would do it? Those that looked at their old life and looked at the treasure, that's him, and said, no comparison. Jesus revealed that to the disciples, to the Jews, to Mary, Martha, and Lazarus that day. And he reveals it to us every day as we see the hand of him working in, around, and through us. If you've not come to that faith or if you question your faith, man, I'm not going to tell you that I have a great prayer that I want to pray with you, but I'd love to talk with you about it. Obviously, you're here because you believe, but what do you believe? James writes, even the demons believe and they shudder. They're fearful of God. Why? They're not changed by God. They're holding on to their own disobedience. And if you are in the faith, praise God for him day in, day out. Walk in his glory. Give thanks to him. Will you pray with me? Lord God, I am so grateful that you are showing evidence of your existence and evidence of your love for us day in and day out. That as we see one thing happen, we understand that that is just the catalyst of a thousand, a million, an infinite amount of things that bring glory to your name. Lord God, let that establish a faith in us that is supernatural, a faith in us that you call us to. A faith that brings us to our knees in worship and adoration of the God that would stretch out his hands to redeem us. We praise you, Lord. Thank you for this time. It's in your name we pray. Amen.